in terms of my own experience with getting serious about creating the skill of confidence is it's a game changer. The more that you build confidence in your life, the greater the risks you're going to take. And that's critical in business, in life, for fulfillment. I also have the ability to say no and not even be bothered by what other people are going to feel. Why? Because I have the skill of confidence. It also makes you an incredible negotiator because you realize you would rather be respected than be liked. And see, this kind of need to be liked or to look good is part of the reason why you doubt yourself all the time. I want you to bring that power back internally. That's what the skill of confidence does. And you'll also be able to recognize when you're afraid of something and that that fear is just kind of bullshit in your head and you have a choice. You don't have to let fear stop you anymore. And that's where the skill of confidence comes in. And the same is going to be true for you. So I think it kind of begs the question, If confidence is something that we all want, why is it so hard to master? I'll tell you why. Because when it comes to the research around confidence, it is some of the most dry, boring, no offense to the confidence researchers and writers out there, but I'm talking if you have trouble sleeping, just print out a study about confidence. That'll that'll put you into deep REM sleep. It's also confusing. And even Google isn't much of a help on this topic. If you search how to be confident, you know what the top results, one of them says? Be true to you. What the hell does that even mean? Be true to you. And honestly, be true to you, that is not what the research says. The problem and why it's hard for people to develop the skill of confidence is the research has not been boiled down into tactical information that you can apply to your day-to-day life. And that's where your friend Mel Robbins comes in. So here's your first assignment on today's podcast, because you know we're not just listening here. This is a doing podcast, and we're going to make this tactical and relevant immediately. Assignment number one, be selfish as you listen. I want you to listen a particular way. I want you to listen and think what's in it for me. And so let me ask you a question to help you get really selfish. If you had more confidence, like I could go and boom, you have more confidence than you've ever had in your entire life. How would your life be different? How would your future be different? Now, Heather has already shared that she has this awesome promotion, which she clearly earned. I mean, businesses don't just give those out as charity. If a business has promoted or hired you, they believe in your ability to execute. But now she's freaking out. She doesn't have the confidence. Now, when you think about confidence, how would more confidence help Heather's life be different? Well, confidence would allow Heather to step into that role, right? And she would be able to lose the self-doubt and the imposter syndrome and the panicking. And she'd be able to act like the leader that the organization promoted her to be, right? Without all the like nervousness and crap going on in her head. What about you? Let's get selfish. What would more confidence allow you to do that you're not currently doing? Would you be able to say no? Would you be better with boundaries? Are there more risks you would take? Is there a conversation you've been avoiding with yourself or someone else? Would you be able to stand up for yourself, advocate more for yourself, ask for what you need? What about work? Would you be more visible? Would you speak up more? All of that that you just envisioned, it's all within your reach. And so let's talk about something that Heather said. Heather said in her question that she doesn't, quote, feel confident in the new role. I don't feel confident. And so I want to start by giving you a definition of confidence that will change your ability to build it as a skill. This definition of confidence I have been sharing for years, and I think I created it based on the research because I haven't really seen it out there before. And this definition is going to surprise you because it's a definition of confidence that puts the research into action. See, here's the mistake that everybody makes. Heather made the mistake because she said that I don't, quote, feel confident. And I bet you're making this mistake with confidence too. In my book, based on the research, that's where we get it wrong. Confidence is not a feeling. Confidence 
is embodied in action. My definition of confidence is confidence is the willingness to try. I'm going to say it again. Your new definition of confidence embodied by the research, confidence is the willingness to try. Confidence is an action. That's what it is. And this phenomenon has been heavily researched by social psychologists. And there's even a term for confidence being an action. See, there's this positive feedback loop that happens when you're willing to try something before you feel ready. When you're willing to step into that leadership role and put yourself out there and take risks and make mistakes and shove that self-doubt to the side. When you're willing to try, neuroscience research says that you create something called a confidence competence loop. And let me explain this to you because there's a lot of common sense here, right? Every single time you try something new, you're either going to be really good at it or you're going to be terrible at it, right? But you always learn something. But you have to try. So Heather is going to step into this new role. She's trying out a new role. She's either going to be really good at it or she's going to be miserable at it. Boundaries, you might be really good at it when you start trying to set them. You might be really miserable at it. But here's the thing. If you try something for the first time, you're either going to fail or succeed, but you always learn something. And that's where this confidence competence loop and the neuroscience research comes in. Because even when you try, when you learn a little something, you gain a little competency, right? Because of everything that you learned the first time around, it gets a little bit easier. It gets a little bit better, but it all begins with being willing to try, no matter where you're starting from. Because if you are the kind of person that's always willing to try, you will always grow and you will always learn. And the more that you try and the more that you learn, the less you doubt yourself, the less resistance that you have. And bada bing, bada boom, all of a sudden you feel confident in this new role. All of a sudden you feel confident doing a backflip off a boat because you tried a thousand times and you belly flopped and you embarrassed yourself and you got a wedgie. And then what do you know? Because you were willing to keep trying, all of that competency that got gained of trying over and over and over and over again. It's how you gained mastery. See, feeling confident is kind of, um, it's, it's almost like the wrong way to say it because that's what you feel after you've done it over and over and over again. But true confidence begins the moment you're willing to try. Okay. And so I, I really think it's important. I can give you another example. The first time somebody handed me chopsticks, I had no idea how to use them. Was I nervous about picking them up and I couldn't get like my fingers to twist in the way that you're supposed to and it was super embarrassed and they kept like flipping across the table and everybody. Here's the thing. I didn't know how to use them. But isn't it common sense that there's no way I was going to learn how to use them if I wasn't willing to try? See, being confident And the skill of confidence is the difference between saying, sure, hand me the chopsticks. I'd love to try. I'm willing to look like an idiot. I'm willing to be a beginner first versus going, can you get me a fork? I don't know how to use those. Do you see the difference? The skill begins with being willing to try. So many of you saw me on the Today Show today. That is the culmination of 10 years of being willing to try, being willing to walk on a stage and have a panic attack or a neck rash, being willing to get behind a microphone and make terrible content or say stupid things or look terrible in videos. You know, you got to remember what you're seeing is a person on the Today Show who has been working hard for 10 years, trying over and over and over and over and learning and failing. That's what you're witnessing. You're witnessing competency, but the skill is something different. The skill of confidence is trying. And, you know, let me remind you of a fact. Everybody starts at zero. Everyone. Whether you're trying to learn guitar or you're building a social media following or you want to get into the YouTube space or you're writing a book or you're selling, everybody starts at zero. That's how I started. Zero speeches given, 
zero television experience, zero social media following, zero email addresses, zero competency in front of a camera or on a microphone. I mean, even take this podcast. Starting this, I started at zero. The tech is intimidating. There are 5 million podcasts on Spotify alone. I'm 54 years old. I don't know how to do that. I haven't done this before. I haven't been in the seat of the person that hosts. But here's the difference with your friend Mel Robbins. I'm willing to try. I lean on this skill of confidence that I've built because I have the definition that's grounded in research. And so do you. You're not going to feel confident. You're going to act in accordance with the research of confidence. You, my friend, are willing to try. That's the secret. You know, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, a lot of you have seen my TEDx talk. So I have one of the most popular and most viewed TEDx talks in the world. I think it's got almost 30 million views at this point. It's a TED talk called How to Stop Screwing Yourself Over. And if you watch my 21-minute long TED talk, you know what you're witnessing? You are witnessing a 21-minute long panic attack. That was the first official speech I had ever given in my entire life. I was terrified of public speaking. And most people are terrified of public speaking. When I was in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, law school, whenever I got called on in class, bright red, bright red. My mind would immediately go blank. The only job I got out of law school was working for legal aid as a public defender in New York City. And when I had to stand in court all day, I was not talking to an audience. I'm talking to a judge and a bailiff and police officers and the prosecutor. It's not like some big stadium. You're in a small courtroom where you see the same people day in and day out. That's not a speech. That's like talking in a meeting at work. But nevertheless, I was so afraid of speaking out loud as a new attorney, I would get these monster neck rashes all over my neck and chest. You know, the kind of rashes that people get when they're nervous or they've had too much to drink or they get an allergic reaction to food. That was Mel Robbins, uh, the early years. You know how I dealt with that neck rash and that fear? I would wrap a scarf around my neck or I'd wear a turtleneck as an attempt to try to hide it. In fact, even when I became an on-air commentator for CNN, I was part of their uh, legal team uh, in terms of providing commentary for CNN. I did that for three or four years. Incredible experience. Never done that before. Why was I willing to do that, knowing that half the time my cheeks would turn bright red, half the time I'd be worried that I might say something stupid? I'll tell you why. Because I understand the skill of confidence. You build it by being willing to try. You have to start at zero. And nobody wants to start at zero. You want to step into this new role and think that you have it all figured out. Well, guess what? You don't because you've never done this before. But if you're willing to try, if you're willing to make mistakes, if you're willing to understand that by showing up every day and trying and trying and learning and failing and falling on your face and dusting yourself off and like putting in the work, eventually the competency catches up. And what neuroscience says is what you're actually experiencing when you can use chopsticks because you've been trying or when you can stand on a stage and you don't have a neck rash that looks like you just got stung by a bee and you're about to go into anaphylactic shock. When you can do that, you want to know why you can do that? It's because the number of times that you've tried have lowered the resistance in your own brain and body to doing it. And so it feels easier. It feels effortless. It's not that you're, quote, more confident. It's that you've built up the competency so that you know how to do it without even thinking about it. And so that's why your friend Mel is so successful, because I'm willing to, A, start at zero, and I'm willing to keep showing up over and over and over and trying and trying and trying, despite my doubt, despite my fire engine red cheeks, despite my flush neck, I've not only gained the competency and settled those nerves, but over time, 
by doing exactly what I'm about to teach you to do. I went from somebody who was terrified of public speaking to becoming one of the most talented, respected, and requested and booked public speakers in the entire world. That's what's available to you today. And so the other thing I want to talk about really quickly is I know that what you think you're up against, Heather, and, you know, if you're struggling with confidence, is that, oh, imposter syndrome. I got imposter syndrome. Well, no shit you have imposter syndrome because you haven't done this before. See, I see imposter syndrome as a really good thing because when you feel like an imposter in a role, that's just a fancy way of saying you're trying something new. And so starting today, if you're in the game of building confidence, everybody, you got to open your arms. You got to reach out for that imposter syndrome, because if you don't have imposter syndrome, you're not doing anything uncomfortable. And if there's one thing I've learned in life after 54 years is that it's only by making yourself face things that are uncomfortable that you are going to grow into the best version of yourself. If you always do the things that you're comfortable doing, you will never, ever, ever experience what might be possible because you're not pushing yourself. And so I don't want you to fear imposter syndrome. I want you to see it as a good thing. Oh, I feel like an imposter. Great. I'm trying something new. This is confidence building. Here we go. And speaking of the myth that imposter syndrome is a bad thing, no, 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 you're learning when it comes to building confidence, you got to embrace that imposter syndrome period because it means you're trying and you're learning and you're gaining competency. And we love that around here. We are talking about confidence and I'm really excited because I'm going to walk you through the five simple tools that help you build this as a skill. And tool number one, take action. This is obvious. I understand we have the definition of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. You're not going to change your life or build confidence by thinking about the things you need to do. You must take action. And so the best action to take, the number one tool for helping you take action in those moments where you feel imposter syndrome or you feel nervous or you're embarrassed or you start to doubt yourself or you feel anxious, whatever the feeling is, forget the feeling. Screw the feeling. We got to take action in those moments because remember, we're building confidence. It's going to require you to try. Just use my five-second rule. I told you the whole story about how I created it, the science behind it in the episode we released way back in the day called Motivation is Garbage. I'll link to that. But if you're brand new to the podcast, let me give you the shortcut. When you're in a situation where you start to doubt yourself, you're just going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and then you physically move within five seconds. So here's how you can use it. Heather's talking about the fact that she wants to build confidence in this new role where she's been promoted. There are things that she needs to do as a new leader, but she doesn't have the competency yet. Instead of thinking about those things, she can use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, to interrupt that self-doubt which is right there in the interior part of your brain and your basal ganglia. It's a pattern to doubt yourself. And as you start counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, your mind switches gears and your prefrontal cortex gets involved. And that's the part of the brain that controls your focus. It helps you interrupt thoughts and feelings of self-doubt. And it draws the part of your brain that will help you take action will help you engage in strategic thinking, will help you encode new behavior and habits. It will help you tap into your courage. That's it. That's all that it is for Alex, who is surrounded by all these high achievers. The next time she's sitting in a classroom and she has something that she wants to share, instead of shrinking in her seat, she's going to try. And the five second rule is going to help. Five, four, three, two, one. And then she's going to shoot that hand up in the air because you know what? Alex has something to say. And even though she doesn't feel comfortable, even though she might get a neck rash, even though her cheeks might go fire engine red, and even though she might stutter or stumble or have dry mouth or whatever might happen, five, four, three, two, one, she is willing to try. Because here's something I want you to understand. You can tap into courage before you start having that feeling of assuredness. Courage is what you tap into. Confidence is what you're building over time. I'm going to say that again. Courage comes first. 
Courage, 54321. You start counting backwards, man, that is an act of courage because you're going for it. Courage comes first. Confidence is what builds over time. How cool is that, right? I absolutely love this because what I'm ultimately teaching you, and this again relates to all the research, is that there's two types of people out there. There are people who think about what they want to do, and then there are people that find the courage to take action. And that's what I want for you, because you're not going to think your way out of fear or doubt or insecurity. You're not going to think your way through your fears and anxiety. The fact is you have greatness inside you, and I want you to start tapping into it. It's only through action that you unlock that power inside you and you become the person that you're meant to be. I mean, that's how I, that's how I've created the life that I have now. If I didn't learn how to 54321 push myself to try, I'd still be sleeping in a bed, staring at the ceiling, consumed with anxiety, feeling like I had ruined my life. That's how you change your life. You have to take action over and over and over again. And so I think you get this. You get that you're not going to change or build confidence by thinking about doing this. 54321, stop thinking and start taking some risks. Start trying. Put a bet on yourself. Let's freaking go. Now let's do rule number two. Rule number two is if you personally just tremble in your boots when you think about doing the things that you'd love to do, let's get back to you. Let's get selfish. What is it that more confidence would have you be doing differently? When you think about those things, speaking up at work, launching your business, tackling your health issues, putting your online dating profile up and getting yourself back out there because you're ready and you've healed and the heartbreak is over and you're ready to have some fun again. When you start thinking about how confidence would change your life, I guarantee you, you're still going to feel a little nervous. So here's a second tool that's going to help you try. You can use the power of objectivity, okay? Let's make it less personal. Be the person you want to become or create an alter ego. This can be fun, you know. We don't have to like white knuckle this this confidence thing. Let's have some fun with it because there's a study out of Johns Hopkins that I love and it's about letting go of self-doubt. And the study suggests that when you use an alter ego or you create a vision of the future you, the person you want to become, it gives you distance from the scaredy cat you who's never done this thing before. So ask yourself, you know who I, what I always ask myself? I go, well, what would The Rock do in this situation? I just love Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. I constantly use him as my avatar when it comes to confidence. What would The Rock do in this moment? And I always get an answer, and it feels less personal. Because you and I are friends. You can use The Rock. You can use me. What would Mel do if you're feeling unsure and you want to tap into the confidence that you kind of pick up on for me? And this also taps into a entire body of research that I talk about a lot on the Mel Robbins podcast, which is behavioral activation therapy. Decades of research show that when you start acting like the person you want to become in the future now in your present life, It's one of the fastest ways for you to change your mindset, for you to create new habits. Why? Because when you start acting like the person you want to become in the future, you start acting like that person today, what are you doing? You're trying. (laughs) You're trying to act like the future you would act. So let's go back to our first question, Heather. When she acts like the Heather two years from now, who's now gotten another promotion because she just slayed it in this role. The Heather today is trying to be the Heather she wants to become. Isn't that cool? Alex sitting in the classroom, surrounded by all these high achievers. When she acts like the Alex she wants to be two years from now, who's earned her doctorate, who is one of those high achievers, who is a bit more vocal, who is able to express her ideas. When she acts like that version of herself now, what is she doing? She's trying. How cool is this? It all just ladders right back to the research. That's why you can trust what I'm telling you. Another tool that you can use to build the skill of confidence is prepare. Because the more that you practice something, the more you're trying and the more competent you're going to be. So if 
you are nervous and you can't shake the nerves, double down on preparing. That's right. Do rehearsals. Run through it. Why? Because every time you rehearse something, you're trying it and it gives your mind and your nervous system the ability to lower the stress because your mind and your nervous system have prepared so you know what's coming. See, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice prepares you. And what's one other thing about practice? What's the first thing that you learned about confidence? Again, I come back to the definition. It's the willingness to try. That's how you put the definition into life, by practicing. Preparing for something, practicing something over and over and over, whether you're, you know, like uh, like the Williams sisters who literally stood there and hit balls 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 before they were even allowed to enter a tournament. What were they doing? They're building the skill of confidence. You want to be confident? Prove it by preparing. I use this all the time. You know, a lot of people, I laugh, like, you know, you, you see me get in front of a, a YouTube camera or you see me walk onto a stage or you listen to one of my audiobooks. And you're like, how do you do that? I've prepared, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> when you're ready, I mean, just think back in your own life. Think about those moments in high school or college where you weren't prepared for the test. How nervous were you? You were shaking in your boots. You couldn't even concentrate. You knew walking into the test that you were screwed. Now think about a moment when you actually studied, which is just you practicing. You feel calmer, more assured. Why? Because you were willing to try by sitting in the stacks in the library instead of going out and cracking open the books. And that's what I'm talking about. This is something you build. Let me tell you about tool number four. I love this. This is a mindset reframe. Because you got the five-second rule, you've got the power of objectivity, what would Mel or The Rock do, you've got preparation, and now let me give you a mindset trick. I love this. I tell myself all the time why it's worth trying. The reason why I tell myself why it's worth trying, why is it worth trying something if I'm only going to fail? Why is it worth going for it if I can't make my dreams come true? I'll tell you why. Because everything that you do in life is preparing you for something that hasn't happened yet. What did I tell you about confidence? Confidence is not something you build when you're winning. I think oftentimes when we're winning, what gets built is arrogance and bravado. And we forget what went into winning at something in the first place. True confidence, the skill of confidence, it's forged in fire. I mean, I've failed more times than... I have time to tell you. You guys know that a decade ago, talk about failure, 800 grand in debt, unemployed, drinking my way through my problems, and all of that heartbreak and headache and breakdown in my life, which was horrendous to go through, it led me to the five-second rule. If there was no debt, there was no drinking, there was no heartache, there would be no five-second rule. When I was a talk show host, I, here I was taping a talk show at CBS Broadcast Center here in New York City. It was a dream of mine to be able to have a daytime talk show. It gets canceled. It was leading me somewhere. Where? To this podcast, which is my most favorite thing that I've ever done in my career. See, I choose not to stay in a place of self-doubt. I choose not to wallow in failure. Because I know that life is always preparing you for something. And I know that your greatest failures, your biggest heartbreaks, they always teach you the most important lessons in life. You know, and, and I keep getting questions from you guys. Mel, oh my God, you're so confident. Like what? You're 54 years old. You keep reinventing yourself. You keep trying new things like this podcast. What is it inside you, Mel? What is it inside me? that makes me take all these risks, that makes me constantly try new things, that makes me willing to fail, to do something embarrassing or even disastrous. I'll tell you what it is. I want to get as much out of this life as I possibly can. And if you look at the math, I'm halfway through it. And it scares me to think that I could be on my deathbed 
and look back on my life and say, I wish I had tried that. I wish I had had the confidence to try that. I do not want to die and have regrets. And so while I'm here, while I'm breathing, while I'm able to, I am going to follow my curiosity. I am going to follow my heart. I am going to try new things. I am going to do absolutely everything that I can do to grow, to feel, to learn. And that's going to require me to take risks. That's going to require me to fuck up things. That's going to require me to look stupid. And I'm willing to do that because I know on the other side of the biggest heartbreaks of your life are the most amazing, heart-filled moments. I know that in the middle of every failure that I experience, and boy, I experience them oftentimes of my own doing, every single failure has, honest to God, equipped me with the lessons and the skill or the wisdom that I needed to be able to do something even cooler down the line. And I can prove it to you. Just, just look back on one of the scariest moments of your life, one of the biggest things that you just blew. I bet you can tell me that that horrible thing that happened, that really hard thing that in the moment you were like, why is this happening to me? That right now, no matter what your life looks like, you can sit here and you know exactly what you learned from it. You know that you would not be the person you are today had it not been for that thing that you experienced, that you survived, that you learned from. And so what drives me is just wanting to experience as much as I can from this one life that I have. And it's not all going to be a joyride. And so I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to look stupid. And I'm willing to do it because I think the payoff that you get, it's worth it. It's so worth it. So this moment, it's preparing me for something that hasn't happened yet. And that, free, that reframe, what it does is it helps me put failure and heartbreak and all the hard shit in life into a box that is something that stays by my side as I move forward instead of a wall or a block or an obstacle that stops me from continuing to move forward, because that's how you move forward. You continue to try. And the final tool when it comes to building the skill of confidence is you have to focus on you because nobody's coming. Like nobody's going to try for you. Nobody is going to be there to motivate you to try. Nobody's going to be there to give you the pep talk. I'm here twice a week. I, I, it really is my mission that these episodes and our relationship through this podcast is one where you feel empowered and encouraged and you're reminded of who you are, that this is like a little reset, a pep talk, that you get the tools and the encouragement and the high five that you need. But ultimately, it's up to you. And you got to learn how to stop looking at the world around you and what everybody and their mother is doing. And you got to look right back in the mirror because you are the one person that you're going to spend your whole life with. And it's time that you start to focus on that person and getting into a better relationship with that person called you. All right. So Cameron, I'm really excited. I'm going to teach you how to create and use what I call a confidence anchor. Not only when you're about to fly and you're nervous, but for any single situation where you're nervous to do something. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Awesome. It's super cool. And for you listening, I want you to just hold that situation that you're nervous about. So maybe you're nervous to give a presentation at work, or maybe you have a son or a daughter who is getting recruited for a sport, and now there's all these big team matches coming up, and they're starting to get nervous. This confidence anchor is exactly what you need. So step number one is you're going to think about this situation that makes you nervous, okay? And we've already talked about that, Cameron. It's this flight to Portugal. Step number two is come up with something about this situation that actually makes you excited. So describe for me, Cameron, what are you excited to do when you get to Portugal? I think the 
thing that I'm most excited for is to see my sister. I haven't seen her in a couple months. She's been in London. So I don't know. I when it when I think about Portugal, there's a lot of things I'm excited for, but probably the biggest thing is just to spend time with her. And I love it. yeah. That's perfect. Okay, great. So you now have something related to the situation that makes you nervous that you're actually excited about, okay? Now, mm -hmm. number three is the most important part. Number three is now that you have something that you're excited about, I want you to close your eyes and we're going to bring it to life. I want you to imagine the moment that you lay eyes on your sister for the <laughs> first time in several months. And I'm imagining, are you imagining the airport or a cobblestone street? Like what is the scene? Describe with your eyes closed. What is she wearing? What happens? Mm -hmm. Describe it for us. Well, first of all, she's probably, I don't know. She's probably mad that we're late about something. But uh, <laughs> when I think about it, we're, yeah, we're in probably like Lisbon where we're going to land and probably right outside, you know, the first glance of a new city, something that is always really exciting when you leave an airport. I think that's the best part about flying is getting to somewhere you're, you know, anticipating seeing. Um, so I picture that. I picture her standing there, probably like in some black sweater, because that's usually what she's wearing. And yeah, her, I think seeing her face reacting to my mom me and my brother that's going to be like the best part because I know she even if she won't admit it she does miss us a lot so awesome and who is she gonna hug first a hundred percent my mom okay awesome and how I'll amazing. probably be last <laughs> okay. and as you stand there and watch her in her black sweater with Lisbon in the background hugging your mom what are uh -huh. you feeling like a sense of comfort a sense of wholeness and yeah, just a really good feeling to have us all together during like a really hard time of the year. It's gonna, it's gonna be really special. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's your confidence anchor. That moment that you just described in detail, the black sweater, Lisbon in the background, her reaction as she sees you, her hugging your mother first, the wholeness, the comfort, all of that that you just felt in your body, that is your confidence anchor. Now, here's how you're going to use it. From now until that moment happens, the millisecond that you feel any nerves or any fear or any negative thought come up related to this thought, you're going to mm -hmm. close your eyes you can use my five-second rule to interrupt the worries. Just count backwards with me. Five, four, four three, three, two, two. One. <laughs> one. Yep. That is a starting ritual that will signal to your brain that you're not going to think about a plane crash. You are starting to think about something else. And then you are going mm -hmm. to bring to the forefront of your mind, that image, that feeling that you just described, and that is how you drop a confidence anchor on these bullshit nerves and worries that have been hijacking your life. That's what a confidence anchor is. You're using your own excitement about something that normally makes you nervous to shatter the grip that fear and nerves has on your body and your mind. That's what you're going to do. And when you head to the airport on the way to the plane, you are going to use this same confidence anchor. And when you get on that plane and your thoughts go, uh-oh, you're going to go, nope, five, four, three, two, one, and you're going to drop that confidence anchor. And when you take off in the middle of the night, 
And the pilot says, we might experience a little bit of turbulence because pilots often say that. You're going to drop that confidence anchor and you're going to come back over and over and over again to this image of your sister and the black sweater and Lisbon behind her and her hugging your mother. That's exactly what you're going to do. And you're going to be shocked because this is a technique that they studied at Harvard Business School called reframing performance anxiety was the name of the study, reframing performance anxiety. And it's a way to flip moments that make you nervous into moments that make you excited and to keep control of your mind, body, and spirit so that your fears don't hijack and torture you. Wow. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, it makes sense because... I think in the moments of panic, the last thing I'm doing is thinking about anything that brings me happiness. It's always the darkest feelings, the heaviest emotions versus, you know, even just closing my eyes just now. I feel so different, like sitting here. I feel like even thinking about that moment makes me happy. And I'm excited to use it because I know I'm going to be anxious all next week, week after. So you want to know why this works? I do. Okay. Seems too good to be true. Honestly, it seems too good to be true. Well, the reason why it works is because it taps into your body's automatic systems. If you look into the neuroscience on this, scientists call this an autonomic response that basically your nervous system has a autonomic response to stressful situations. Okay. That like, if you're a normal person like me, you just say, oh yeah, we, if we're in a stressful situation, we automatically feel all kinds of things. Right. And so what I want mm -hmm. you to understand is that, you know, when we're in situations that make us nervous, everybody, whether you're giving a speech or you're going into an interview or you're on a first date or you're running a track meet or you're getting on a plane or you're breaking up with somebody or you're going in for a job interview, it is going to be automatic that your nerves take over because you're about to do something that makes you stressed out a little bit. It's requiring you to feel, it makes you feel a little bit vulnerable. But here's the cool thing. Even though you have this automatic response, because you're right, there's no way over the next five weeks you're not going to feel anxious because that's the autonomic response that your body has to this stressful thing. But here's the cool thing, Cameron, you can control this. So here's, here's the secret. The secret is understanding that your body's reactions to fear, so your automatic reaction to a fearful situation, is the exact same as your body's automatic response to an exciting situation. And we're going to use this truth that your body's automatic reaction to fear is the same as your body's automatic reaction to excitement to your advantage. So tell me about a situation that makes you excited, like just something like in your day-to-day -day life, okay? Give me a situation that makes you excited. In my day-to-day -day life, that makes me excited. Uh, well, how about this? Who's your favorite musician? Uh, I really like the Lumineers. Okay, great. Guess what? Mm -hmm. The Lumineers are playing a private concert at the new private venue at the Fenway Park. You, my friend, not only have front row seats, you're going to meet them before the show. Okay. It's five weeks out. How do you feel? Jittery a little bit. Um like kind of the same feeling I would have if I, you know, was playing a big soccer game or running an important race uh -huh. when I was younger, like the clammy hands, the pit in your stomach. Yep. The, Dude, like, we're walking into this venue. You're walking up yeah, to the front like, row. How you feeling? My heart's beating fast. I'm like going a million miles an hour. I don't know. Probably feeling like really on edge. Yeah, the usher is coming up to be like, okay, they're ready to meet you. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'd be like, okay, okay. Like, let me collect myself. <laughs> yeah, probably really flustered and uh, I don't know, like a little bit anxious probably. So it kind of sounds like a situation like that where you're about to meet your favorite band which I would say, is that a positive or a negative experience? Yeah, that'd be amazing. I mean, 
a positive one, obviously. Well, it sounds very similar to the way that you experience the thought of flying to Portugal. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's true. Yeah. You want to know the only difference? When you're in the situation that's positive, that makes you excited and you're about to meet the Lumineers, your brain mm -hmm. is telling you you're excited. Your brain is telling you the jitters in your stomach are butterflies. And that's a good thing. Your brain is telling you your hands are clammy and your heart is racing because something good's about to happen. The only difference between that and what you experience as you think about flying to Portugal is what your brain is saying about the flight. When you start to experience butterflies in your stomach as you are about to board the flight, your brain's going, uh-oh, there's something wrong. This is negative. I'm going to, the plane's going to crash. You're experiencing in your body, Cameron, the exact same physical and physiological symptoms when you meet the Lumineers as when you board a plane. And the only difference is what your brain is saying about it. And so the reason why a confidence anchor works is we are going to shut your negative brain down and drop this confidence anchor right on it like a sledgehammer. And we're going to replace <laughs> your narrative that something's wrong with, holy shit, I'm about to see my sister. This is so exciting. It's as exciting as meeting the Lumineers. And when your brain starts <laughs> to say the butterflies are positive, you won't escalate yeah. into a panic attack you will have taken control. How cool is that? That's pretty cool. So do you have any questions about the confidence anchor and how you're going to use it? It just honestly seems still a little bit too good to be true. Like, I don't know. I can just conquer all my fears just by flipping the way I'm thinking. There's a scientific reason why this works. So they researched this at Harvard Business School. And what they did is they put people in control groups and put them in situations that made them nervous. So they put uh, one group into a control group where they had to run a track meet. Another one had to sing karaoke. Another one was in like a debating competition. And they taught one group of people to use this reframing tool where you think about something related to the track meet or the debating competition or karaoke that you're excited about. And so this group was taught to say, I'm excited. I'm excited to run this meet. I'm excited to get up there on the stage and conquer my fears. I'm excited to, to go and debate because I've prepared. The people who use this simple reframing tool outperformed the people who didn't. They felt less nervous, and there's a scientific reason why. Earlier, we talked about the fact that there are these auto, automatic responses that our body has to situations that are exciting or stressful. And in our case, Cameron, we talked about the Lumineers and how that's exciting, meeting the Lumineers and getting on a plane to Portugal, which used to make you nervous. Just talking about those two situations created an automatic response in your body, didn't it? Yep. That automatic response is nothing more than a series of chemicals firing and messages firing between your brain and your nervous system. The reason why you and I get butterflies is because when the brain sends a message down to your nervous system that, holy cow, we got to get on a plane, or holy cow, the Lumineers are about to walk in, your mm -hmm. nervous system goes, oh, got it, and immediately starts changing up the chemicals in your body. Adrenaline fires. The blood races to your head and to your heart. That's why your heart starts pounding. That's why your thoughts start to race. Now, you get butterflies because... The signal in your brain going to your gut just changed the chemicals in your digestive tract. That's why we all get butterflies. That's it. And so in the situation with the Lumineers, you flipped your thoughts. I'm excited to meet them. And so that explains all the reasons why you have all the, these changes going on in your body, why your heart is racing, why your butterflies are in your stomach. This automatic response doesn't scare you because you're thinking positive thoughts when it comes to the Lumineers. Now, when you get on the mm -hmm. plane and your brain signals to your stomach that something's up and your heart starts to race because the blood goes to your heart and the butterflies start to flutter in your stomach because the chemical structure just changed in your digestive tract, 
If you have negative thoughts about the plane, a couple things happen. You start to get scared of the automatic response in your body. And more cortisol starts to flood your brain, which is the stress hormone. And once that happens, what they found at the Harvard Business School study is that the cortisol interferes with your brain's ability to do whatever you had prepared to do. This is why most of us, when we stand on a stage, go blank. It's because we have an automatic response. Our brain goes, oh shit. We get scared of our racing heart because we think it means that the plane's about to crash or we're about to screw something up. The cortisol floods our brain and we forget what we prepared. When the cortisol floods your brain, you forget about seeing your sister. You forget about all the exciting things. You forget about all the research that you did that shows that traveling by commercial airplane is the safest way to travel, period. Mm -hmm. That's why this matters. And it's more than just thinking positive thoughts. It's critical that you come up with the thing you're excited about before you get into the situation. Because once your thoughts start to race and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to screw up this test or oh my God, I'm going to screw up this interview or oh no, the plane, you've already lost control. You have to come up with this exciting anchor and this confidence anchor before you start to get nervous. Got it? Yeah. Any other questions? It just makes so much sense. You know, I always have taken the approach of calm down cam like you know kind of making myself to be the bad guy um and not really reframing it in any way just letting myself kind of soak in all the stress and anxiety (laughs) uh and just kind of reprimand myself being like what the heck you know why are you why are you not just calming down like there's a six-year-old that's you know bouncing and around and it's like oh I love when the plane goes up and down and it's like why can't I be like that six-year-old but uh, let me yeah, tell you why I think this I is get... excellent Cameron let me tell you why you can't bite <laughs> okay. by that six-year-old because I love this analogy the six-year-old's brain is not attaching negative thoughts to the plane bouncing up and down as far mm-hmm. as the six-year-old is concerned this is exciting that's why they're not panicking and so yeah. the reason why In the history of telling yourself to calm down, you have never been able to calm down is because you are dealing with an automatic response in your body. So let's go back to the science. When you get into a situation that makes you nervous or that makes you stressed out or makes you afraid or that makes you excited, those are states in your body of high agitation. Those are states of alertness. Those are states when your blood starts pumping and your brain starts paying attention and, you know, everything kind of aligns because you're about to do something that makes you excited or fun or nervous or afraid. And so you go into a state of being hyper alert. That state of high agitation is one that you can't calm down like that. So what Mm -hmm. we're doing when we teach you to create a confidence anchor And to use excitement to reframe what you're feeling is we're taking a state of high high agitation from the negative to a state of high agitation in the positive. We're actually using the automatic response in our body to to our advantage. And we're just tricking our brain to believe that we're actually excited because our brain doesn't know the difference. Your brain is like the six-year-old. Your brain actually doesn't know the difference between excitement and fear. That baby that's bouncing is feeling the heart racing and then the the bubbles in her stomach. It's just that your brain is framing it in the negative. Because your brain knows that excitement and that fear feels the same, that lumineers, that meeting the lumineers and being on an airplane feels the same. You can use that to your advantage and trick your brain in a moment where you would normally be nervous to actually think you're excited. And the reason why this matters, Cameron, is because when you're on that plane, if you can come back over and over and over to your confidence anchor 
And if you can close your eyes in a moment of turbulence and you can imagine your sister and you can start to say out loud, and this is important, you've got to say to yourself, I'm so excited to see, what's your sister's name? Sienna. I am so excited to see Sienna. I'm so excited to see Sienna. I cannot wait for Sienna to hug my mom. I cannot wait for this. If you come back to that confidence anchor, you are going to flip your brain into believing that you're excited about that moment and you will no longer be afraid. And it's a way to gain control. And you know what? You want to know something really cool? Because your confidence anchor is related to what you're doing, it's really believable. Mm -hmm. Because when you are there hugging your sister, it means the plane made it and there's nothing to be worried yeah. about. That's why this works. When you imagine before a test yourself walking out of there going, yes, it actually makes you excited to take it. When you imagine yourself nailing the interview, it makes you excited to walk into it because your brain doesn't know the difference between a state of fear or a state of excitement. And now you know a simple trick backed by research from Harvard to take control of your mind and take control in situations where nerves normally derail you. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that was always like in the back of my head during our conversation was if I'm still, I feel fear in a lot of different areas of my life, not mm -hmm. when I'm just in the air. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on the ground, how can I use this tool to ground myself? Even if I'm not sure the outcome of it. I love this. Okay, great question. I want you to take out a notebook and you're going to write down any okay. single thing that makes you nervous. Could be anything. I mean, what? give me a couple. Oh There's a long list probably, but uh, off the top of my head, like something that, I don't know, I really wish that I could beat the fear on is I recently moved um not that far but there's a really nice yoga studio on my street that I like pass every day and I just always think like I need to be a part of a community of 20 somethings that are like-minded that you know I just I've always loved yoga I've loved the community it brings um but I cannot bring myself to sign up and I can't bring myself up. Like I just constantly think about the day I have to show up for my first class and it makes me way too anxious to even like go. This is an excellent example. And by the way, incredibly common and very relatable. Yeah. So I'm really glad you shared it. So you're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to create a confidence anchor. Because what I hear is I hear you want to do it. I hear mm -hmm. it pulling you and the nerves are keeping you back. So name the name something you're excited about. So like, can you pick like a coffee shop in your neighborhood that you love to go to and it's going to be your treat to get a nice latte when you're done? Yep. Do you yeah. want me to name it? Yeah, I do. It's called Thinking Cup. I love Thinking Cup. Now, <laughs> you're going to close your eyes. What okay. color yoga tights are you wearing? Oh, God. Maybe like, I have this really nice light blue ones that I always like to wear. I love it. And as a treat, because you went to this relaxing yoga class in your light blue tights, sweatshirt tied around your waist, yoga bag over your shoulder, standing at Thinking Cup, what did you order? Um, probably like an iced oat milk latte. Love it. <laughs> Love it. How do you feel Yeah. as you're walking out of the thinking cup, having just completed that class and treating yourself to that? How do you feel right now? Like proud of myself for doing it. Awesome. There's your confidence anchor. Anytime you feel nervous, you're going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one to interrupt the nerves and create that starting ritual and you're gonna drop that confidence anchor. And what's gonna happen 
is it's going to slowly retrain your mind that you're not nervous about joining that yoga studio. You're actually excited. Guess what we're talking about today? You and me, baby. We're talking about the it factor. That's right, the it factor. I don't even know how to say it, but we're talking about it. Some people just have it, don't they? Just think about who you admire that has the it factor. I'll give you my list. Oprah, The Rock, The Dalai Lama, Taylor Swift. Oh, and the late Robin Williams and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Those folks, they have the it factor. Why? Well, because they have this ability to make me lean in and care about what they're saying. We not only admire folks like this, but we like them and we trust them. That is the heart of having the it factor. And based on the research, when people have the it factor, you know what it means? It means they have charisma. Charisma is a really cool thing because charisma will make you more influential. It'll help you make a bigger impact. And charisma absolutely is going to help you make some more money. Because according to the research, 82% of people's impression of you is based on whether or not you display charisma. Did you hear that? 82% of someone's impression of you based on whether or not you got charisma. I know I said it twice. That's how important it is. And here's the coolest thing about charisma. It's really easy to hack when you know the simple things you need to do. So today, here's what we're doing on the show. You're going to meet one of the world's leading researchers and experts on charisma and body language, Vanessa Van Edwards. She's a behavioral investigator, the founder of the research group Science of People, the author of the best-selling books on these topics, Captivate and Cues, and she's here to prove to you that you have the it factor. Yes, I'm talking to you. And the skill of charisma, that is how you are going to bring your it factor to life so you can make an impact, you can influence people, and you can make more income. Let's go, man. Class is in session. I am so excited for this. So let's dial up the skill of charisma. Let's bring the it factor to life. Let's increase our influence, impact, and income, people. And let's welcome Vanessa to the Mel Robbins podcast. I'm so excited for this. Vanessa, I'm so glad you're here. Well, welcome. I'm so psyched you're here. I'm so happy to be here. I can't even tell you. Well, let's just jump right into it because you have written the book oh. on both charisma and body language. And so I want to start with what is charisma and why does it matter? What people don't realize is that charisma, more than any other attribute, is the single most important aspect of you being successful. It helps you in your relationships. It helps you professionally. It helps people take you seriously. It helps you also feel more confident and purposeful in your interactions. So charisma is that missing ingredient that we need to trigger or activate our success. Wow. I mean, you hear so much about confidence. You hear about extroverts versus introverts. But how is it that charisma impacts all those things more than your personality or confidence. When research looks at highly charismatic people, they find that we are looking for people who are signaling high charisma because it shows all those other things. Highly charismatic people are confident. They are competent. They are warm. They are likable. And so the most amazing aspect of charisma is it can be learned. It is not an innate trait. You don't have to be born with it or not, that anyone can, be, can learn how to be more charismatic through a very specific set of cues. That's crazy. And you, you say that you were very awkward before you leveraged all the cues you're about to teach us. Will you tell us a little bit about what you struggled with? So what's funny about charisma, I've always been fascinated by this trait. I'm a recovering awkward person. <laughs> so, charisma does not come naturally to me. I've always been fascinated by the cool kids. You know, I watch them and I'm like, oh, how do they know what to do? And so I was for many years trapped by this mistaken belief that to be charismatic, you have to be extroverted. You have to be bubbly. You have to be life of the party. And I am not an extrovert. And so I always thought, well, I guess I can't have it. It's an innate trait. You have to be extroverted. But research actually finds is that Charisma has nothing to do with your extroversion, your attractiveness, your athleticism, even your intelligence. The actual definition of highly charismatic people, what makes them different is they set, send a very specific set of social signals. Specifically, they are constantly signaling high warmth, so trust, likability, friendliness, 
along with, and this is the key, a balance of high competence, capability, power, effectiveness. And what's magical about this is if you're with someone and you are drawn into them, you immediately are able to answer two questions. I can trust you and I can rely on you. And so highly charismatic people, that's what they're signaling, warmth and competence at all times. Wow. Okay. So let me see if I just can bottom line this. Yes. So charisma, if you have charisma or you display charisma, I guess is what I should say. Yes. If you display charisma, other people are left with the impression that they can trust you and that they can count on you. Is that right? That is exactly right. And the funny, the hard part about this is you can be the warmest, most competent person in the world, but if you don't show those signals, the world does not believe you. And this comes from amazing research out of Princeton University, which found that under signaling, so not signaling enough, and this is what happens, I think, with very smart people. So most of my students are off the charts, intelligence, high achievers, and they think, oh, my smarts will speak for me right? I, I'm really smart. I can make it through anything. I'm super prepared. I have great answers. And the problem is they under signal the warmth and competence cues. And what Dr. Fisk found, the creator of this research, she found that without enough warmth, people do not believe your competence. So the problem of smart people is they think their smarts work for them, but if they're not using the right signals, the world literally cannot believe them. Wow. That's so... so is this why charisma matters? So I think of charisma like a lubricant, right? So when we're in social That's interactions, sexy. <laughs> a social <laughs> that is lubricant. That's not exactly the word I was <laughs> that I thought that or the metaphor I thought you were going to use. Okay, so charisma it, it is a social smooth. lubricant everybody. Yeah, okay. It makes it smooth, you know? It makes it smooth because listen, my interactions, my social interactions before I learned this science were like the opposite of smooth. They were crunchy. Like not in a good way, right? Okay, like, so you said you were awkward. Give us an example. I, Come on, I'm Vanessa. A, I'm a recovering awkward person. So awkwardness, let's talk about awkwardness is one of my favorite topics. Awkwardness dresses up in different ways. So my awkwardness, and everyone has a different things. So I'm curious, Mel, if you have any awkwardness, how it dresses up. Some people, they feel awkward because of fear. Their fear of being rejected, fear of being criticized, fear of saying something silly or sounding stupid. And so their awkwardness will dress up as shutting down. So for me, my awkwardness, I'm an overthinker. I'm the person who I get in bed at the end of the night and I literally rethink every conversation I've had the whole day, <laughs> right? Or like I, I overanalyze my answers before I even say anything, which makes mm -hmm. me a terrible conversational listener. So my awkwardness would make me shut in, shut down. And so my introverts listening, this is often what happens when you feel awkward, you're afraid of a silence or being judged. You shut in, you close down, you stop talking. Other people, my extroverts, their awkwardness dresses up as something else. Their awkwardness dresses up as showing off over the top, being a drama queen, talking too much. Some of my extroverted awkward friends, they'll say, sometimes I, can't, I just can't stop talking. Literally my mouth just keeps going. And so awkwardness is this really interesting way that we try to cover our fear. And so when I say I'm a recovering awkward person, I've had to conquer a lot of internal fear to be able to have interactions that I desperately, desperately want to have. That could be in a professional setting, sharing my ideas, but it also could be just trying to make good friends, trying to be open with my partner. And so I think that charisma is this lubricant because awkwardness makes our relationships, our conversations, our communication crunchy, awkward, halty. We talk too much. We talk too little. There's an awkward silence. We don't know what to do with our hands right? We're like, what do I do with my body language? We make weird faces. We awkwardly nervous laugh. So my, my goal with charisma, what I've found is that it's a smoother, it's a lubricant, which I just, I, we have to stick with that metaphor. Well, it's, it's hilarious. Easier. And it also makes it, it, it you, when you use the word crunchy about those moments when you feel awkward, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because whether you're an over talker, over sharer, nervous laugh, interrupting people because you're extroverted, but you feel afraid of how people are going to view you or whether you withdraw because you're afraid, that crunchiness is that sort of disruption you feel internally. And so I love this idea that charisma, which you say is a skill that anybody can develop, 
-hmm. that charisma helps you be yourself and it helps you be more influential and it helps you enjoy social settings, whether you're introverted or extroverted. That's what, that's what I'm kind of getting from this. Oh, that's it. And so I think that what we're looking for here is a lot of people talk about confidence and I love confidence, but I am not naturally confident. And so what would happen is I would say, just be more confident. Like I would, you know, I'd be like trying to mantra myself into it. And if you tell someone who's awkward to just stop being awkward, it, it doesn't work. Oh, so it what, just makes you more awkward, I think, because then you're it, now focused on the it, fact that you're awkward. It's like a meta meta, right? Like I worry that I'm a worrier and that, mm -hmm. that makes me worry. You know? <laughs> so, right. So like, it's like a horrible meta. So what I say is, okay, I like confidence, but let's put it to the side for a second. Let's talk about being purposeful. Purposeful is much more impactful and active. It's, it's an active emotion. Okay. So if I say, I want to show up in this interaction as highly charismatic, I want to be my warmest self and my most confident self. And I want to clearly signal with purpose to the other person, I am trustworthy and likable, but I can also get it done. I'm powerful and capable. The key here is the balance. Most of us have an imbalance. So there's four segments of the population. This is what the research finds. There's the sweet spot of highly charismatic people, high warmth, high competence. That's the rare birds among us. Who now, are can able you to give balance. us an example of somebody who is highly charismatic? Let's do the classic Oprah. Okay. Oprah is highly charismatic. And here's why she can be in an interview and she can make the other person feel so comfortable. They share their darkest secrets. That's warmth. Mm. That's trust. She can cry with the other person. She can mimic their facial expressions. She, her warmth literally draws out other people's warmth. However, you also take her very seriously. You know, she is smart. She knows her answers. You can't sneak something by her. And that's her signaling, I'm competent. I'm going to make sure that I get to the truth here. You can rely on me to ask the hard questions. That's the perfect example. What Oprah does and what most charismatic people do, which I want to teach everyone who's listening how to do, is you can use charisma like a dial. It's just like a thermostat. So in some situations, when you want to dial up a little bit extra warmth, you can use more warmth cues. And Oprah does this exceptionally well. In her hard hitting interviews, she'll dial up competence. She'll hit them with the hard right. questions. Go watch her interview with Lance Armstrong. I talk about uh, Lance Armstrong a lot in the book. I pick on him a lot. Her interview with Lance Armstrong, she is high competence. She has just enough warmth to make him feel comfortable, but she asks hard questions versus some of her other interviews. She's dialing up warmth. She wants to make the other person feel comfortable. So that's an example of someone who's very uh, nice balance and kind of uses her warmth and competence as a dial. Let's look at, for example, Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs is- often Zero warmth. Am, am I? No, zero warmth. Zero Steve warmth. Jobs. Like, zero oh, man, warmth. What a, the guy's a jerk. Zero warmth. So he is the perfect example of high, high, high competence. He has, he's constantly signaling, take me seriously. I'm powerful. And most importantly, what highly smart people don't realize is if they over signal competence, people see them as cold, intimidating, not a collaborator, not a team player, hard to talk to. So yes, he, he was brilliant, but his lack of warmth made people feel like he wasn't a collaborator. He wasn't a good team player. And his legacy is changing the world, but also being not kind. So that's an example of high competence. My highly smart people, my engineers, my really technically brilliant folks, they often get trapped in high competence because they don't know how to signal warmth. Mm. By the way, they might have all the intention to be a collaborator, but we are not taught how to signal warmth. And so they go, well, I guess I don't know how to do that. So that's wow. okay. high competence. That's one bucket. And by the way, so if you're, as you're listening, I want you to think about what sounds like you, what feels like you. So do you feel like you have the balance? Do you feel like, no, you're off the charts in competence? You know, you're high in competence. If people always think you're in charge, you know, you're high in competence. If people have ever told you that you're intimidating or hard to talk to, you know, that you're in a relationship or have a partner who's high in competence. If they constantly Google fact check you. <laughs> so highly competent folks, their mission is to get it right. They are very uh, dominated by the idea of get it right, get the facts. And so they'll be in a conversation with you and be like, let me Google fact check that. Let me just see if that's, that's right. Do they share their emotions if they're high competent? 
usually less. They're much less comfortable sharing their emotions because vulnerability, sharing emotions is an aspect of warmth. So that mm. is one way that competent people can hack warmth is sharing more of their emotions. But usually they don't like that as much because emotions aren't correct, right? It's hard to be right with emotions. So they'll often, the reason why a highly competent partner, I have one of those, is I, I'm going to use the word afraid of emotions or uncomfortable with emotions is because it can't be fact checked, right? Hmm. If someone says as a partner, um, I feel upset with you, how do you verify that? How do you fix it? Where's the solution? A highly competent partner, they love solving things, right? You come to them and you're like, I'm just having a bad day. And they're like, let me fix that for you. And you're like, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. And they're like, oh, no, I don't know how to do that because they're fixers. Got it. So highly competent people, you have that super strength of, of getting it right, being fixers. Warm folks, my warm folks. So my highly warm folks, you are filled with empathy, your cheerleaders, your supporters, your mission. So if competent people want to get it right, highly warm people want to be liked. They want everyone to feel good. They want everyone to feel comfortable. Typically, highly warm folks, their super strength is empathy, nurturing, making people feel loved and warm. But they often give too much of themselves in sacrifice of being liked. Got it. So like people-pleasing doormats is what you're talking about. That's the far end. People yes. pleasing is what they struggle with. And so I think that highly warm folks in the workplace, this is the other really important thing to understand is if you are highly warm, you are fighting a battle in yourself, which is your desire to be liked gets in the way of your need to be respected. Mm. Okay. Stop. I need everybody to hear that. If you default and you are too warm, especially at work, your need to be liked is getting in the way of your need to be respected. Yeah. And when you are too focused on getting it right and too focused on being smart and too focused on dominating the conversation or the knowledge bank, your need to be right is dominate. How did you say your need to be need right? To be right is getting in the way of your need to be liked. Yes. Yes. Your need to be right is getting in the way of your need to be liked. That even rhymes. That's amazing. I didn't I want to do that on purpose. <laughs> I want to go back to something in the very beginning that we were talking about. Yes. So when I asked you what is charisma yeah, and you said it has nothing to do with personality it has nothing to do with introversion or extroversion. It is not about being confident that charisma is something that you display to other people, correct? Yes. And charisma matters because if you have charisma, people trust you, they like you, they count on you, which I would think means it makes you in more influential, it makes you more successful. It makes you have greater influence. Is that what the benefits of charisma are? Influence, impact, and income. So the reason Whoa. why- Hold yeah. on, hold on. So charisma yeah. impacts the three eyes. The three eyes, all three of them. Why? If you are warm and competent, you are less likely to be underestimated. You're less likely to be dismissed and doubted. Why? We are attracted to highly charismatic people because charisma is contagious. And they have actually proven this in the lab. The more charismatic you are, the more you clearly and purposefully, I keep using the word purposeful on purpose, the more clearly you signal warmth and competence, the more contagious you are. We like to be around warm, competent people because they make us more warm and competent. And so nonverbal signals, vocal signals, verbal signals, we are constantly aware of because we want to catch them. So the reason why we're drawn to people who are the in, that influence piece, that influence or impact piece is because we are influenced by people who we want to be contagious with. Mm. We also want to be more warm and competent. So if we're around someone who's warm and competent, it makes us feel like our best selves. If you think about the most, the most charismatic person, you know, so just think about them for a second. They make you feel better. They make you feel like your best self. That's the difference I think between, for example, a highly charismatic person and a narcissist 
right? Like this is not just about confidence. It's about someone who actually is positively infectious. And they've proven this with both negative and positive cues. So for example, um, Dr. Matthew Lieberman at UCLA, he flashed people a fear microexpression. So fear microexpression is when we raise our eyebrows up our forehead and we white, widen our eyes to our white show and we take in a deep breath. So we go, <gasps> yes. So that expression, if he flashes that expression to someone in a fMRI, their amygdala where they process fear begins to activate. We catch the fear. Literally just seeing someone with a fear face makes us feel afraid. The most important part of this experiment though is the moment that someone labeled the fear. So in their head or out loud said, fear, it deactivated their amygdala. Hmm. In other words, being aware of the cues that are being sent to us, both negative and positive, makes us aware of who is infecting us. So that influence, that impact is that highly charismatic people are so clear with their signals. They're, it's like they're gifting, another Oprah reference, they're gifting warmth for you, competence for you, charisma for you, and not charismatic people, people who are anxious, afraid, awkward, they are signaling negative cues. That's why we don't want to be around them. We don't want to catch that fear, right? Like we don't want that fear. And so we're like, whoa, I don't like those signals. And so we avoid them as much as we possibly can. You know what I love about your research? What I love is that, first of all, you're about to teach us all how to become more charismatic. You're oh, yeah. also about to give us hacks related to body language and getting intentional about what we're displaying and signaling. Yes. But what I also love about your research is that I need everybody listening to understand something. Right now, you are unintentionally sending signals and cues to people. That's it. You are walking around, and whether it's a negative mood or it's anxiety or it's insecurity or it's awkwardness or you're so focused on being right that you don't realize that you're sending signals and cues that make people not like you and not trust you or you're so focused on being liked and that you're sending these signals of being a warm pushover which is why you're never respected and why you're passed over at work and so what I love about this research is that you're helping us focus on two factors that you can display that will increase influence, impact, and income. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether you're shy or whether you're bossy. These strategies are going to work for all of us. Mm -hmm. One thing I would love for you to talk about before we talk about the cues is this. So in that study that you cited from Princeton, Yes. They also found that charisma accounts for 82% of how people evaluate you. So can you unpack that? Because I think it's really important for us to understand. This is not only a good idea because you're going to make more money, be more influential, and make a bigger impact. Based on the science, this is how people view you. And so can 82%. you unpack this for us? So I was also shocked by that number. By the way, it's very rare to see a number that big in science, right? Especially because if I were to ask someone, how do you want to be perceived? You're going to get a list of a hundred adjectives, funny, extroverted, bubbly, attractive, whatever. Actually, when someone is interacting with us, and by the way, this is not just in person. This is on your LinkedIn profile in Zoom, on the phone, in chats, in Slack, in DMs, in your email inbox, people are using warmth and competent signals to make up 82% of their judgment of you. Okay, stop. Everybody, did you just hear that? People are using warmth and competence, which are the two things that make up your charisma. 82% of how people judge you, evaluate you, size you up, decide to hire or date you has to do with whether or not you're warm or competent. That's bananas. It's bananas. And it's not just your first impression. It's actually every single impression. So yes, your first impression is important. But even if you don't feel you've had a good first impression, that's okay. We are reevaluating this on every Zoom call. If someone sees your name pop up in their inbox, 
they're also wondering, is this, a, is this a warm and competent email? In other words, can I trust this email? Can I rely on this email? The hmm. more warm and competent your email is, the faster response rates you're going to get. We as humans have a really hard time responding to, connecting with, building rapport with, being impacted by people who under signal or people who signal in an imbalanced way. So what we're talking about here, that 82% is making it easier for people to interact with you. I believe that your warmth and competence tells the world how they should treat you. Wow. So and it, you here's want what I treat. believe, Vanessa. You want to hear what I believe, Vanessa? Yes. I believe we all have a huge blind spot when it comes to what we're signaling other people. That you may think you know how you come across and what you're displaying, but I have a feeling that we are about to learn from Vanessa that we have a massive blind spot when it comes to warmth and confidence and how you're displaying charisma or not. So how can we, number one, figure out how charismatic we are? What okay. do we do, Vanessa? Okay. All right. So first, we're the first kind of diagnostic that I talked about was just which one sounds more like you. That's where we start, right? So where do you think you fall? You hire in warmth, hire in competence, you have a balance, or you under signaling, right? Do you shut down and not signal enough? Okay. The next thing you can do is you can actually do our diagnostic. It's totally free. And I love this because there's two ways that you want, I want you to do this. You can take this as many times as you want. The whole point, I, the reason I put it up from the research is because I want people to be able to Take a diagnostic, see how they come across. So they're going to be very simple questions. Does that mean like, a test? Yes, it's a test. Okay. Really simple test, sciencepeople.com slash charisma. Wait, hold on. What's a, what, what, what is, what is the URL? Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. Wait, is that the New York Times Science of People? No, just my <clears throat> Science of People. Oh, that's your site. Okay. Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. We will put that in the show notes. So you can take this test. As many times as you want. And so first I want you to take it as you. I want you to take it as you. And I want you to take it not on your ideal self, your real self. Okay. Okay. okay? So on a, on a normal day, I want you to screenshot your results. Then what I want you to do is I want you to do a 360 review. I want you to send the quiz to a partner, a friend, a colleague and ask them to take it as you. This is the key because it's going to show you how other people see you and mm. have them screenshot the results and then go to dinner and get a lot of wine because it'll be a great <laughs> conversation. <laughs> so do you find that most people have no idea how they're showing up with other you, people? You were right. Most of us have a blind spot. We think, we hope, we think of ourselves as our ideal selves. And there are days, of course, where we are a little closer to that sweet spot of warmth and competence. But what's really key, what we find is that not only are people giving them different results, but they even might even have different results for home and work. So they're showing up as two selves. And that's a very important thing to know about yourself. If you're going to work and you're dreading it, you're burnt out, you're drained, it could be that you are not honoring who you truly are because you're either under signaling competence or under signaling warmth or trying to fake it till we make it. I have a little problem with that phrase. I don't love that phrase because I, I think it. that the problem is if you're going to fake warmth, it's exhausting, right? And so this is also a way to sort of get a very quick snapshot in how are people perceiving you and is it what you think you're showing? Um, you also have a suggestion that we record our Zoom calls in order to read how charismatic we are. That sounds horrible. It's horrible. I'm not going to lie. It is horrible. And not only do I want you to record a Zoom call, I want you to record a Zoom call that you worked hard on. Presentation, an important client meeting, a call, and then I want you to code it. So when we talk what about- What does code it mean? Okay. So when we talk about cues, so cues are the social signals humans send to each other. Okay. There are four different modes of cues. Verbal, the one we talk about the most, so our words. This is what we most of us think about all the time. We want to prepare the perfect answer, share the perfect presentation, we practice our stories. So verbal is only one mode of cues. Second is nonverbal, our body language, our gestures, our facial expressions. The third, the most important one that's overlooked is voice tone, our vocal power, our volume, our pace, our cadence, our tone. And the last smallest one is ornaments. The jewelry we wear, what's behind us in our background, uh, the, the color of our nails, how we wear our hair, our glasses, those are the ornaments. What I want you to do is I want you to code yourself for every cue that you're showing. 
everything from how many gestures you're using to what your facial expressions are doing, to your movement, to your fidgeting, to your vocal power, to the kinds of words you're using. That's also going to give you a snapshot because what we've found in our research is that there are certain very clear signals of warmth, cues of warmth, and cues of competence. And the last one are danger zone cues, cues that are negative. My goal, this is a way that you can see is how are you signaling warmth and competence? What are you doing with your body and your, va- your voice and your face that's making people treat you the way that they're treating you? So what are your top tips for displaying charisma and being more influential on a Zoom call? Okay, so on a Zoom call specifically, there's a couple of nonverbal cues that translate really well over camera. So one of them you do a lot, which is a lean. So a lean is a universal charisma cue. The reason for this is because when we're trying to understand something better, when we activate our five senses, we lean in. We hear something better, we lean in. We wanna see something better, we lean in. We wanna smell something, we lean in. So a lean cue is what you can do on a Zoom call when someone says something super interesting or powerful. We do this in person, but on Zoom, we forget that we had that kind of personal interaction. So if you were to say something, Mel, that was super impactful, I would go, really? Wow, that's so interesting. Not even a lot, just a couple of inches. And I want to do a little experiment here so you can actually feel this. Wherever you are right now, if you're sitting or standing or running or cooking, I want you to lean forward just two inches. Go ahead and try it with me. What research has found is that when you lean forward two inches, it actually activates a pre-action part of your brain. It literally makes you more motivated. And so what can happen is when you lean in, it makes you a better listener. It also is contagious. It tells the other person, wow, they like what I'm saying so much. They're literally trying to lean in to activate what I'm saying. So you want to use the lean very purposefully when you hear something good or when you're saying something that you want someone to pay attention to. So if I, for example, even on this interview, when I'm saying something that I really strongly believe in, I will bold it by adding a lean. So I'll say, this is one of the most important things I could share today. That is a cue for you. Bold, bold. Listen to this. So leans for you listening and as a speaker. I love that. Easy. Is there any phrase or something that you suggest, particularly somebody who's shy or introverted, to say or do during a virtual meeting to be more influential? Ah, okay. We didn't even talk about verb verbs. We didn't even talk about words. So words are an incredibly important aspect of our charisma that we also need to address, right? So for, for verbal power, what you want to do, especially for my introverts, and especially on a video call, is use warmth verbal cues. We actually did a study uh, with Dr. Paul Zak. Dr. Paul Zak is a big oxytocin researcher. He's incredible. He's one of my good friends where I wanted to know during the pandemic, if saying warm words could stimulate connection. So in other words, I'm on a video call. If we were in person, Mel, you and I would be hugging, we'd, you know, high five, we'd, we'd have some sort of touch. I wanted to know, could you replace that verbally? What we found was we had people wear, he created a software that people wear that measures their skin conductance, and their physiology. When I say, I'm sending a virtual high five. I wish I could give you a digital hug. I'm uh, giving you a warm wave from here. When I say those words, it actually triggers a physiological response on your skin. So one thing that you can do in the very start of a call or at the very end of a call is, oh, I wish I could give you a hug. A virtual one will have to do. Oh, or you know, this has been so lovely talking to you. I just feel so much warmth and I just had such a great time connecting with you. Using warm words, connection, warmth, trust, hug, handshake, they actually trigger a physiological response to the other person. So if you can use those warm words, it is a very easy way to trigger more warmth. That's fantastic. Easy. Okay. Terrific. What about emails? How do you display more influence, more charisma in an email? What is the pros? What's the danger zone? Okay. So remember the good news is, by the way, I just want to say a a big rule here. I'm sharing a lot of cues. Some of these cues you're going to hear and you're going to be like, oh, that one is so good. Great. Some of the cues I'm going to say, and you're going to be like, I don't know about that. That's good. I actually want you to follow your instinct. There are 96 cues in the book. It's like a recipe. There are some ingredients you're not going to like. 
And I don't want you to do cues that you don't like. For example, um, one of the cues I teach is a steeple, right? So it's, a, it's when you just touch your fingers together and you make sort of like a church steeple. If you watch Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary loves this gesture. Yes. Some people love it. Some people hate it. If you love it, great. If you don't, discard it. So when I'm about to share cue wise, I want you to make sure that you actually like it before you use it. Like you're able to use different ingredients. Like that's right. actually a good thing. I totally forgot what the question was. We have a no problem. Actually, let me ask you this one. What yeah. are the danger zone cues on a virtual meeting? What should okay. you never do? Okay. So great. Okay. So danger zone cues in a virtual meeting. One, I always, 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 always want you to front with the camera. So research is very, very clear what, on What this. does that mean front with the Fronting. camera? Okay. So when we are aligned on parallel lines with someone, our brain likes it. So fronting is when I angle my toes, my torso, and my top towards the camera. Research has found that if I were to give the entire interview with one shoulder angled back and my toes angled out, it would actually make it hard for you to believe me. It would make it really hard for you to open up to me. And so a mistake that I often see on Zoom calls is people will either angle out or the worst of the worst, they have their camera on their side and they're typing like this. Oh, so I, yes. I, I hate that. I hate, I'm uh, like, just turn the damn camera off. Yes. I would rather. So one thing I want you to make sure of is your setup. Not only are you a foot and a half away, but you are on parallel lines with the other person. So you're angling your toes, your torso, and your head towards them. This is both on Zoom and in person. Even in person, when someone is kind of angled out and they're trying to talk to you, you can literally feel the disengagement. The reason for this is because our toes are sort of secret windows into the soul. So I like to call them. Your toes, the way that they're pointed, usually indicate a secret direction that you want to go. So I have noticed anecdotally that when someone is ready to leave a conversation, you know, you're at a networking event or at a holiday party and they have to go to the bathroom or they're kind of done, they will angle their toes towards the exit. And wow. Their body is like, we gotta go. We want to go. So if I'm angled away from you with my toes angled towards the exit, you're subconsciously picking up on the fact that part of me is left the conversation. You know what I'm realizing? That's stage one of me trying to get my husband, Chris, to leave a party. Yeah. I go up and walk up to him, but I'm angled toward the door. Like, let's go. And I do that physically without realizing it before I put my hand on my back and they're like, Let's go. Yep. So, so interesting. Okay. So we know danger zone. You got to, you got to face the camera. You got to be pointed at the camera, toes at the camera. Yes. Otherwise you're signaling lack of interest and not that competent either. If you're not yeah, paying attention. Another danger zone cue is a facial cue that I want to, I just want to point out. So, um, <laughs> resting bothered face, right? <laughs> resting bothered face is when at rest, our face look bo looks bothered. Um, I have resting bothered face rather badly. Um, and that is important to understand about yourself because sometimes at rest, people will say, are you angry? Are you tired? You should know what your resting face looks like. So for example, if your resting face, my resting face looks like sadness. Mm. So sadness is a universal micro expression. So sadness is when our, the corners of our mouth turn down into an yeah. upside down U. And when our eyelids droop and sometimes even our, our eyebrows pinch together, when I'm at rest, I tend to look a little sad because that's how my mouth points. This is important for me to know because if you look sad at rest, people are going to assume you're disappointed. You're low energy. How about anger? What if you have anger? So anger is a different look. I don't have this, but I know people who do. So people I do. have, I, yeah, who have anger at rest, they pinch their eyebrows so that these two vertical lines appear in between yep. their eyebrows. So they might be concentrating, but they look a little irritated, a little frustrated, a little angry. None of these are right or wrong, but it's important to know how people might be perceiving you when you're just listening. So since I know that I look sad, I work hard, especially when I'm listening to someone and trying to encourage them to dial up warmth. If you know that you look angry at rest, it's really important for you to dial up, making someone feel reassured, making someone feel like they're not frustrating you, that you're really happy with them. That way, verbally, you're overcoming that resting face. Yeah. So like the three head nod, 
The mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. See, mm-hmm. I just got rid of the bitch face, and now there I'm there signaling. Did. Exactly. More. I'm I'm taking the the cues here. This is great. All right. Now, what are strategies for dialing up charisma and influence, warmth and competency in emails? Okay. Emails. Yes. So I love in an email, the most important thing you have to do in an email is break social scripts. So what happened in the email, we're so overflow, over, overloaded with email. So I love running tests on our email newsletter. So we have an email newsletter and I can actually see what's getting open rates, what's getting click rates. And one thing that we found is anytime we are, we trigger someone's autopilot is when we use a subject like follow-up or information (laughs) or update or next week's meeting. You are literally (laughs) telling the other person to go to sleep. Go to sleep. (laughs) So are you saying we can have fun in work emails? Yes. Now fun, what I mean is use charisma verbal cues. So there is, this is art, not science. Certain words trigger an emotional response. For example, okay, so one study, this is a really interesting study. What they did is they wanted to know if achievement oriented words could make people achieve more. So achievement oriented words are words like win, success, master, achieve, compete, race. Even me just saying the word win could actually change the way your brain thinks. So here's what they did, very simple experiment. They brought people into their lab. They split them up into two different groups. The first group got an intelligence test with a very simple set of directions. These directions were completely autopilot, socially scripted, sterile. Please take the following test to the best of your ability. You have 10 minutes to complete it. Please use a pencil. Okay. Very, very basic directions you've read a million times before. The second set of directions was the same word count. So not longer, not shorter, but they sprinkled in, they swapped in a couple of achievement oriented words. So uh, please perform well on this achievement test. The more answers you can win correctly, the better. Uh, Please succeed with a pencil, right? So they just sprinkled in a couple of achievement oriented words. They found that just three or four achievement oriented words not only made them perform better on the intelligence test, it doubled, doubled the participant's desire to keep working on the test. Wow. That's pretty cool. It's so cool because it means in your emails, you can gift behavior change. Okay. So for charisma, which impacts influence and income and uh, interest or in whatever the heck they are, uh, mm-hmm. impact. Impact. Um, so for email, what words do we want to use? Are we throwing in emojis and gifts? Like, how does this work? Obviously okay. not all caps and tons of explanation points, but. No, no. Okay. So what I like in an email is to have, and I have samples of this in the book, if you want to like read a template is I want you to have warm words, a couple of warm words, warm words, trigger the warm and fuzzies. So, so happy to connect with you last week. I'm so looking forward to collaborating in our meeting next week. When people read words like collaborate, they are literally more likely to be collaborative, okay? So you are actually gifting behavior. What I want you to think about when you're writing an email, this is a really weird way to write an email, but it works. How do I want someone to think, feel, and behave after reading this email? If you want them to be warm and collaborative and open and happy and trustworthy, use those words. You are literally gifting them that feeling. But if you want them to get it done, be productive and efficient. Let's brainstorm. Let's power through onwards. Let's do it. I want you to gift more competent words. So the perfect email yes, has yes. a balance of let's connect. Let's collaborate. I can't wait for the meeting next week. And let's blast through this agenda. I can't wait to hit our goals. We're going to do everything together onwards, Vanessa. You know what I hear is I hear enthusiasm. I hear confidence in those words. You're displaying that which then signals to me that I'm on a team that wants to do that. You want to know one word I don't like in an email? Oh, tell me. I hate that trend that started a couple years ago where people would generically sign everything best. Best best to me as a sign-off is like passive-aggressive, not interested, phony pretending I give a shit. That's what best means to me. And it's socially scripted, right? Like, yes, it doesn't even mean best. It doesn't even mean anything. A little experiment that we did in our newsletters is I was trying different sign-offs 
And I wanted to know if I could change like people's perception of me based on the sign off. And so now I use after a series of tests, always every sign off in my email is to your success, Vanessa. Oh, thank you. It's Vanessa. Like, it's like a gift. It's like success. Yes. Let's gift it. <laughs> I love that. And you know what I just noticed? Hmm. I spoke at the end of my breath. So I was like, oh, thank you, Vanessa. Like I went up on that. And I don't know if that means that I was not being, uh, no, piece, I actually it, mean it. So now I'm going to breathe. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> I don't know. But, it, but actually that was authentic because you were, it was, it was a compliment. It was appeasement. Yes. So you were in, encouraging liking. So you went really high because you loved it. What I we did. Do, we're around babies and puppies. We go yes. really high like this because we really, really want them to feel good. That's good. Oh, oh that's so nice. Yes. But. But remember, all of our all of our uh, people pleasers out there, speaking like that around puppies and babies, and when you truly mean it because you want to compliment something, someone, that's great. Speaking like that all the time because you are seeking reassurance or seeking being liked, that's killing your ability to be respected, and it's also not authentic. And this works with toddlers, right? I have a toddler, four and a half. She's not even a toddler anymore. If I'm serious with my toddler, I go real low, right? I'm real low. I'm like, Sienna, uh-uh, we are not doing that. And she hears it. So you also can use, when you, you're talking to your baby or your puppy or your toddler, and you're like, good job, wonderful job. Don't touch that, right? There's a big difference. They hear that too. Little oh, ones do they hear ever. Do, oh, do they ever. Like when yeah. Chris lowers his tone of voice, Everything in this house stops when the three kids are here. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.